One of the words commonly associated with Christmas is the word Advent. Many churches have Advent wreaths adorned with Advent candles. Some celebrate the four Sundays of Advent leading up to Christmas itself. And I even heard this last week, there are Advent carols that are different than Christmas carols. I couldn't tell you which ones they are, but I know that they exist. But do you know what Advent means? For as much as we use the term, do we even know what we're talking about? According to Webster, Advent means a coming into being or use, such as the Advent of Spring, which right about now I'm thinking we would all like to see, (laughs) or the Advent of Personal Computers, They're coming into being in use. So with that in mind, we can see how the birth of Jesus can be called his advent. His coming into being as a human, or as John 1.14 puts it, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now it's not as popular these days as in generations past, but there's another usage of this word in connection with Jesus. Christmas is sometimes referred to as Jesus' first advent, meaning his first coming, while his second advent speaks of his return to earth. And you'll often see classic preachers and commentaries use that term second advent, which simply means second coming, the second coming of Jesus. And so tonight, As we celebrate Christ's first advent, I'd like to consider his second advent. Now, in my early days of studying scripture, I came to appreciate a British preacher and author named G. Campbell Morgan. And one year at the Westminster Chapel in London, he preached four sermons on the purpose of advent. And the fourth of those sermons was entitled, To Prepare for a Second Advent. Now, the text that he chose to preach from was Hebrews 9, 28. Christ also, having been once offered to bear the sins of many, shall appear a second time, apart from sin, to them that wait for him unto salvation. And I liked how Morgan began his message. Our thoughts are turning with gladness to the first coming of Jesus. The light that shone or the plains is shining around us. The songs which the shepherds heard we also hear. And the new hope that filled the hearts of shepherds and wise men in that eastern land at the advent of Jesus is still in our hearts at this time. Yet we are all conscious that nothing is perfect, that the things which he came to do are not yet done. The victory seems not to be won. There seems to be very, very much still to do. Or, if I may put this in another form, it is impossible to read the story of the first advent without feeling in one's deepest heart that something more is needed. The first advent demands something else. Therefore, we turn with relief to the declaration of the New Testament which formed the very hope and song of the early church. The declaration which states that he who has come will come again. That the first advent was indeed preparatory and that the consummation of its meaning can be brought about only by another coming. Just as personal, as definite, as positive, and as real in human history as was the first. Indeed, this second advent or the second coming of Christ is a recurring theme throughout the New Testament. Jesus told his disciples in John 14, 2 and 3, after telling them that he was about to leave them, he said, I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that where I am, you may be also. When Jesus ascended into heaven, and the disciples are just standing there looking at the sky, two angels said to them in Acts 1.11, Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking at the sky? This same Jesus, who is taken from you into heaven, will come back in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. 
And there's no less than five times in the book of Revelation itself where Jesus refers to his coming back to earth. Now, Max Lucado writes in his new book, Because of Bethlehem, we live between the advents. The second advent will include the sudden, personal, visible, bodily return of Christ. Jesus promised, I will come again. The author of Hebrews declared Christ will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting for him. As he came, Christ will come, but he won't come as he came. He came quietly in Bethlehem. He will return in glory with a shout. In Bethlehem, Joseph placed Jesus in a manger. At his return, Jesus will be seated on a throne. In Bethlehem, the just-born Jesus slept. When he returns, the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. At his first coming, few noticed. At his second coming, all the nations of the world will be gathered before him. In Bethlehem, Joseph placed Jesus in a ma- I already saw that. Well, he said that twice. Now, what will happen next and what we hope for is what God promised, a new heaven and a new earth where justice reigns. See, history is not just a meaningless, endless succession of circles, but directed movement toward a great event. God has a timeline. And because of Bethlehem, we have an idea where we stand on it. As the Apostle John said, my dear children, these are the last days. We enjoy the fruit of his first coming, but we anticipate the glory of his second coming. We refuse to believe that this present world is the sum total of human existence. We celebrate the first advent to whet our appetites for the second. We long for his next coming. And ever since Jesus ascended into heaven with a promise to return, Christians have not only longed for his second coming but have longed to know more about the second coming, particularly when it will take place. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 36, no one knows the day or the hour when the Son of Man will return, not the angels of heaven, not even the Son, only the Father. So we cannot pinpoint with any accuracy a day, a month, even a year when Christ will return. And if you read anybody who does Just save yourself some time, throw it away. (laughs) Because as soon as they put a date on the return of Christ, you know that they're not biblical. But I do believe that we can see in the course of events that will take place toward the end, where his coming will fall. Now there's a lot of debate, there's a lot of disagreement about this. What I'd like to do this evening is to present what I have found to be consistent, not only in the book of Revelation, but in all of Scripture when you put it all together. We begin in the 11th chapter of Revelation. Verse 15 states, The seventh angel sounded his trumpet. And for those of us that have been working our way through the book of Revelation, we we think to ourselves, it's about time. Finally, the seventh trumpet sounds. I mean, we've been waiting since Revelation 8.13 for this third woe to arrive. Now it is here. Now, I want to underscore the fact. The sounding of the seventh trumpet is not said to be the end. It introduces the end. Because we're going to see that things take place after the seventh trumpet is sounded. In fact we get into a whole nother group of sevens, the seven bowls of God's wrath that are about to be poured out. But I believe the seventh trumpet is very, very significant in God's course throughout the end times. Now remember when we were looking at the seven seals, that the seventh seal introduced the seven trumpets. In the same way, we're going to see that the seventh trumpet is going to introduce the seven bowls of God's wrath. But that doesn't take place until chapter 15. 
So what we have between Revelation 11.15 and Revelation 15.1 all falls under the seventh trumpet. And that's going to become important as we look at this tonight. Now, we've already studied chapters 12 and 13. In those chapters, John looks back. Chapter 12, he chronicles the ongoing battle between Satan, the dragon, and God. Chapter 13, he introduces two characters that will arise at the end. The beast from the sea, which we call the Antichrist. The beast from the earth, we call the false prophet. And we saw how they are going to declare war on God's people. They will hunt them down. They will capture them. They will imprison some. They will put to death others. And it looks very, very bleak for the people of God at this time. In fact, Jesus says in Matthew 24, unless those days were shortened, even the elect would be eliminated. I don't believe that's going to happen. I believe Jesus is going to intervene before that takes place. But it's moving that way. There are fewer and fewer true believers on the earth as more and more lay down their lives for their faith. So I want to take a look here at the end of chapter 11, then go right into chapter 14 because I believe it flows perfectly together, and consider this final trumpet, the final warning of God to an unbelieving world before his wrath is poured out. Now, the sounding of the seventh trumpet sets off a heavenly celebration in verses 15 through 19. The seventh angel sounded his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven which said, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Makes you want to sing the hallelujah chorus, doesn't it? (laughs) In fact, that is precisely the passage that Handel Put to, put to music in what we know of as the Hallelujah Chorus. comes out of that verse right there. And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you have taken your great power and have begun to reign. The nations were angry, and your wrath has come. The time has come for judging the dead and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and your saints, and those who reverence your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. Now, we have seen these 24 elders previously, and having them fall down and worship at the throne is not a new thing. But here in their worship, they mention three things that are about to take place. God's wrath, the judgment of the dead, both the righteous and the unrighteous, and the destruction of the wicked. You see, we've gotten to that point now where there is no more time. There's no more time for unbelievers to turn to God. I believe they have been given their last chance. And as we have seen, the vast majority of people on earth at this time will not repent. Now, in our last message, the first half of chapter 11, it talked about a great earthquake that took place before the seventh trumpet. And as a result of the earthquake... The survivors in the holy city, which we believe to be Jerusalem, meaning these are probably Jewish people by heritage, by, by heredity, turn, they gave glory to God. And we saw how throughout Revelation that means to repent of one's sins and to trust in a Savior. I believe that the last believers on earth are going to be Jewish people who finally turn and accept their Messiah. They will see Jesus for who he really is. And we saw last time how that is a fulfillment of prophecies in Romans chapter 11. 
And that God will do this for the sake of the patriarchs, for the sake of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That they will see members of their earthly family come into the spiritual family that they began. Now, that is done. And God is about to pour out his wrath on an unbelieving world. And that seems rather scary to us. But before we go on, let me remind you, no matter what the world looks like today, no matter how out of control things appear, in the end, God wins. Never forget that essential truth. And with the 24 elders, we too can fall on our faces and worship God in light of that great promise. Now, I do want to note, the King James Version renders this, the kingdom's of the world have become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. That first kingdom should also be singular. In the Greek, that's how it appears. The idea here is that behind the many diverse kingdoms that have ruled men in human history, there lies a single source of authority. Satan himself is called the prince of the power of the air. Other places he's called the prince of this world. And what you see here are ungodly governments and ungodly men who have reigned. They all have a common source. And you really see this coming together in the reign of the Antichrist because he will be a world ruler. And he will be against everything that God stands for. Now I also mentioned the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. That is also singular. There's not two kingdoms, and there's not two kings. There is one God, one kingship. And this is very clear in this passage because it says, and he will reign. It doesn't say, and they will reign. And he will reign forever and ever. Christ is the incarnate Son, anointed by the Father and with the Holy Spirit for the fulfillment of God's redemptive mission for the world. Now, heaven itself opens, and for the first time, we see the Ark of the Covenant being mentioned here. You remember the Ark of the Covenant, right? It was fashioned by Moses while they were in the wilderness. Uh, It was the place that represented the presence and the power of God. It was placed in the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle and later the temple. The Philistines briefly captured the ark in battle, but they soon returned it because all kinds of plagues were breaking out against their people until they gave it back. But when Solomon's temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C., the ark disappears from the biblical record. Now, there is a legend that the prophet Jeremiah went into the temple and hid the ark before the temple could be destroyed There's no place in scripture that suggests that, and quite frankly, it's impractical. Number one, anybody except the high priest on the Day of Atonement that went into the Holy of Holies was struck dead. There's no way he could do it, and he couldn't do it by himself because one person couldn't lift the ark. And, you know, if we were to believe the script of Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, we know that Indiana Jones discovered it, and it's now at the Smithsonian somewhere in a box. No, that's not it either. More than likely, the Ark of the Covenant that Moses made was destroyed by the Babylonians. We're not talking about that Ark here. Remember, the book of Hebrews says that the Ark of the Covenant of the Old Testament was only a copy of the original. Hebrews 8.5 says, They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. See, this is the original Ark of the Covenant that Moses made a copy of when he was here on earth. We're talking about the temple in heaven where God is. And the idea here of seeing the Ark of the Covenant is we are seeing that God's covenant is about to come to completion. He has not forgotten his promises. So now we move over to Revelation chapter 14. The trumpet has sounded. There are praises in heaven. And with 
Chapter 14, beginning in verse 1, John says, Then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb, standing on Mount Zion, and with him the 144,000 who had his name and his Father's name written on their foreheads. Then I heard a sound from heaven, like the roar of rushing waters and like a loud peal of thunder. The sound I heard was like that of harpists playing their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they kept themselves pure. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. They were purchased from among men and offered as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. No lie was found in their mouths. They are blameless. Now, in going to chapter 14, of course, we skipped over 12 and 13. We've already done those. But in the context, chapter 14 shifts from evil to good. Chapter 13 is all about the Antichrist. And his followers took a mark of his number, 666, either on their right hand or their foreheads. Here we see the Lamb of God, the true Christ. And instead of masses of people bearing the mark of the beast, here are the 144,000 with the mark of God on their foreheads. Now, people have wondered, is this Mount Zion, is this scene here on earth or is it in heaven? Frankly, there's good arguments for both. We don't know. And that's okay. We need to remember these scenes aren't meant to satisfy our curiosity, but to warn the rebellious and to encourage the righteous. So let's not get too caught up into the particulars that we miss the message. I believe that George Eldon Ladd is correct when he writes, The first vision here pictures the destiny of the people of God who have persevered through the Great Tribulation, but have fallen prey to the wrath of the beast. I believe that what we're seeing here are the martyrs. These are the ones who were faithful, who would not take the mark of the beast, who would not bow to the image of the beast. They maintained their allegiance to their Lord, and because of that laid down their lives. It does appear that many, many, and and that 144,000, I do believe, is symbolic in the number, but you're talking about a large number of people who are going to lay down their lives for their faith. And in the eyes of the world, they were losers. (laughs) They lost their lives. They threw away their lives because they wouldn't take this silly little mark. Well, it wasn't a silly little mark to them, and it wasn't to God either. What you see is that they are victorious. Here are the souls of these martyrs who are standing with the Lamb, victorious, not defeated. And we see this in preparation for what is about to come. Now, they're described here as those who did not defile themselves with women but kept themselves pure. I don't believe this is a call for celibacy. Throughout the Old Testament, you often hear of one's spiritual condition likened unto purity. Idolatry that was committed by the Israelites was likened to adultery. It was like a wife being unfaithful to her husband. And you see that image throughout the scriptures. And I believe that's what we're talking about here. These are people who stayed true to their Lord. But they were also described as those who... uh, No lie was found on their lips. They were blameless. I think it does challenge us that we need to live what we we proclaim. Our testimony isn't going to be very effective if we're not living what we claim to believe. I think that's what is being underscored here. These were people whose, whose lifestyle, their manner of living matched the message they were proclaiming. And I think that's a good lesson for us. Now, three angels appear in midair. The first has the gospel message to be proclaimed. Verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in midair, 
And he had the eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. He said in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. This is the only occurrence of the word gospel in the whole book of Revelation. And the message is simple. Fear God, worship him before it's too late. Now, we know that God did not entrust the gospel message to angels. He entrusted it to us. But I think this is a graphic way of describing that the gospel of the kingdom has been preached to all nations as a testimony, and now the end will come. Mission has been accomplished. Now the second angel declares victory over Babylon the Great. Verse 8, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great which has made all the nations drink the maddening wine of her adulteries. If you'll remember, in chapter 11, John introduced the beast that comes out of the abyss before he ever told us who he was. Same thing here. He introduces Babylon the Great, doesn't tell us anything more about her. We are going to pick this up later as we get into later chapters of Revelation to to see who this is. But we do see that Whoever Babylon the Great is, which will be discussed later, has been defeated, has been overcome. And then the third angel warns of the consequences of allegiance to the Antichrist. Notice verses 9 through 11. If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark on the forehead or the hand, he too will drink of the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of his wrath. He will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment rises forever and ever. There is no rest, day or night, for those who worship the beast and his image, and for anyone who receives the mark of his name. This is nothing less than hell itself. And that is what awaits those who follow the Antichrist and don't put their trust in the true Christ. The emphasis here is on the wrath of God, and that's a key idea in the next phase of Revelation, which we'll start next week. God's wrath, we need to understand, is not like our human emotion of anger. It's a settled reaction to the unholiness of man. God is holy. He cannot stand sin in his presence. And in order to be just, which God is, unrighteousness must be dealt with. There are consequences to every choice. And God has said that those who choose willingly to reject him will face his wrath. And that will take place. Now once again in verse 12, the saints are encouraged to endure patiently, to live faithfully in spite of all the pressure to succumb. This calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commands and remain faithful to Jesus. See, this is John kind of stepping out from recording all that he's seeing. And he's saying, okay, folks, listen up. Tough times are coming, so you hang in there. You remain faithful. You continue to obey God's commands. You resist the world and what it's trying to do. You remain true to your God and King. Their faithfulness to God might bring about their physical death. Certainly in the end times it will. But verse 13 pronounces a blessing on those who die for the Lord rather than giving in to the world. Then I heard a voice from heaven say, right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they will rest from their labor for their deeds will follow them. What an encouragement this is. For all those who stay faithful to the Lord to the end. Yes, we mourn their passing from our lives, but we know that they are in Christ. We know that they are at rest and that their faithfulness on earth will follow them and be rewarded in heaven. Now finally, we get to a harvest-like collection in verses 14 through 20. John writes, I looked. And there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man, with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. 
Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, Take your sickle and reap, because the time to, co- to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia, which is about 180 miles. Now what we have here is a harvest. I believe this is a reflection of Jesus' teaching in Matthew 13, where the good represented by wheat and the evil represented by weeds or tares are separated at the time of harvest. Now, not every detail is an exact match, but that's not unusual when you're dealing with parables. It is my conviction that this harvest in Revelation 14 is nothing less than the rapture of the church. If you consider this passage in light of other texts dealing with the Lord's return, you'll see things match up. I wish we had time to go to each one of these tonight. We don't. I'd like to give you the passages. I'd like you to look them up on your own and compare them side by side and see if you don't see these things in common. Matthew 24, verses 27 through 31. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 through 55. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18. And Acts chapter 1, verse 11. If you didn't get all those written down, uh, you can see me afterwards and, and we'll have those for you. John sees a white cloud with one sitting on it like the Son of Man. Now Jesus predicted in Matthew twenty four thirty that the Son of Man would come in the clouds of the sky. We already saw in Acts one eleven how the angels told the disciples, why are you staring into the sky? The same Jesus who was taken up to you into heaven, and by the way, it's told that he was taken into the clouds, will come back in the same way that he left. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, that the Lord himself would come down from heaven and that the saints would be caught up in the clouds to meet him in the air. Now, there are some that claim that the one on the cloud is just an angel. But nowhere in Scripture is an angel referred to as one like the Son of Man. This was Jesus' favorite designation for himself, and it comes from Daniel 7, 13. Now, the fact that an angel tells Jesus to reap because the time to reap has come does not place the angel in authority over Jesus. What it does show is that Jesus himself does not know the day or the hour, which he already said, but that the Father sent the angel to tell the Son, Now. Now is the time. Go and harvest. Another similarity is seen in Matthew 24, 31, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, and 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. All of them refer to a trumpet call when the Lord returns. Now, Revelation 14 doesn't mention a trumpet, but remember, this is the seventh trumpet. <laughs> It has sounded in chapter 11, and all of this is following right in together. It's all considered as one event. Notice in particular 1 Corinthians 15, verses 51 and 52. Paul writes here, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, meaning die, but we shall all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. Now, this is the only place else in the New Testament where the trumpet is called the last trumpet. And I ask you, what's that mean? What does it mean that this is the last 
trumpet. I went through all of my commentaries on 1 Corinthians 15. I couldn't find anybody that would even comment on that phrase. Why is it considered last? The closest I got was one commentator said, apparently this is the last in the series of something. Well, no kidding. Anybody that knows the English language knows that's what last means. But what does it mean biblically? And I suggest to you that the last trumpet in 1 Corinthians 15 is the seventh trumpet of Revelation. Now, there are those that disagree. One of my uh, most esteemed preachers that I love to listen to and, and utilize his work a lot, Chuck Swindoll, he does come out and ask the question, are these the same? And he says no. But that's because of the particular theological position he holds he doesn't give any biblical reason why it's just because it doesn't fit into that system I don't see anything that keeps us from equating the last trump of 1 Corinthians 15 with the seventh trump of Revelation 11 now after I had done my study and I had written a little book on Revelation and was describing my view here that I believe that Revelation 14 is describing the rapture. I had somebody mention to me, oh, that sounds like the pre-wrath position. I had never heard of the pre-wrath. I mean, I've heard of pre-trib and mid-trib and post-trib and all-millennial and all these other things. I never heard of a pre-wrath. But I looked it up, and there's actually a book written by a a Jewish Christian named Marvin Rosenthal, and it is called The Pre-Wrath Rapture of the Church. And so I picked it up and went through it and thought, man, this guy read my book before I even wrote it. Now, I don't agree with everything he says. I I have yet to find anybody I agree with everything they say except Scripture. Uh, But this is a very intriguing view. It's, It's very different than probably anything you've ever heard before. And I think he brings out some extremely valid points. And he does say that the last trump of 1 Corinthians is the seventh trumpet, and this is the rapture. Before God pours out his wrath on the unbelievers, he will take his children home. I think that's consistent with everything Scripture says. And I believe that that's what we find right here. Placing the rapture at this point in Revelation, I think, makes contextual sense as well. See, we've been going through the time of God's warning. All of these trumpets up till now have been warning shots. Oh, they've been severe judgments, but they're always in the minority. One-third of this is affected. One-fourth of that is affected. When we get into the bowls of God's wrath next week, you're going to see that there's no fractions. All of the green grass, all of the rivers and streams, all of the oceans are going to be affected. See, the trumpets are warnings. The bowls are wrath. And who has been providing the warnings? Well, God is sending the judgments, but it's his emissaries here on earth that are proclaiming the message. And once that's been done, once the warnings have been given, our job is over and God is going to take us home. Then he will pour out his wrath on the church, on the world. Now, I will admit I have gone full circle when it's come to where the rapture takes place. I was brought up to believe in a pre-trib rapture, the church will be raptured before the Great Tribulation. In Bible college, they taught post-trib. We go through the whole thing. Um, This is kind of a modified mid-trib, whatever. I think this is what the Bible teaches, and it makes sense, not just of Revelation, but of all of these other passages where it describes the coming of Christ. You see, all these things that are similar, the cloud, the voice of the archangel, the trumpet, and the dead will be raised, and then those who are alive and remain, which probably won't be many, will be caught up into the clouds and to be with the Lord. Now, that grape harvest that you see later, I believe that is the unbelievers. Because very definitely this is a harvest unto wrath they're put into the wine press of God's wrath see some people think that the grain harvest and the grape harvest are just two angles of the same event I think they're two different things Jesus said that before the tares would be 
pulled out and burned, you harvest the wheat first. And I believe, again, it's consistent with the teaching of Christ. I think it's consistent with the teaching of Paul. It's consistent with the Old Testament prophecies. Everything comes together and finds its fulfillment here. Now, you may not agree with that conclusion, and that's okay. One day we'll find out how it all comes out. The important thing to know is that God is always in control. And that before he pours out his judgment on the world, he will take his children home. When precisely that takes place, we can debate until it happens. The important thing is we need to be ready no matter what. So what does this tell us today? Regardless of how we interpret the various elements of this passage, we can all agree that no matter how difficult circumstances might be, No matter how defeated God's people may think they are, Jesus Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is in control. And one day he will return. And we who are faithful to him will triumph. Even though it looks bleak now, he will prevail. I'd like to conclude this evening by referring again to that message I mentioned at the beginning by G. Campbell Morgan. This was his conclusion. He is coming. This is my hope and confidence. That is my hope and my song for the world this Christmas time. He came to commence, to initiate. He will come to complete. Christ shall appear a second time apart from sin unto salvation. Salvation means judgment wrought out in the impulse and power of love. We stand tonight between the two advents. Our relation to the first creates our relation to the second. To receive him as rejected is to be received by him at his coronation. To accept his estimate of sin and share in this value of his atoning work is to enter into his coming administration of righteousness. To trust in the first is to wait for the second. How stands it between my soul and the advents, the first and second? I'm not trying to cast a cloud over the merriment of Christmas time, but have a reason for your merriment. And in God's name, cease your merriment if the Christ who was born and of whom you sing is excluded from your heart and your home. The blasphemy of it, the tragedy of it, the shame of it. People who by persistent sin are crucifying this Christ afresh every day, yet make merry this Christmas time. If you have admitted him and found room for him, for whom there was no room in the inn, if you have handed him the kingdom of your life, though the world still rejects him as in days of old, then make merry. Let your songs abound. Let your hearts be glad. Give the children a good time. But I warn you against all merriment if you have shut him out. For he comes again. And if in spite of the light of the first advent you have rejected him, He must, on the basis of eternal justice, reject you. He is coming. May we so trust him as to the meaning and merit of his first advent as not to be ashamed of him when he comes again. To which I can only add, amen. He has come the first time. He came as a baby in the manger. He's coming a second time, and he's coming as king. But it's how we relate to that baby in the manger that's going to determine how we relate to him as a coming king. We must trust in him now to triumph with him then. And that is the true meaning of Christmas. Let's bow together. Father, I realize that in the study of passages like this, there's a lot of competing ideas a lot of debates and discussions as to what will happen and when and the sequence of events. But Father, I am so thankful for the indisputable message that your son came the first time to deal with sin and is coming a second time to establish his throne. And for those who have received him and his gift from the first coming will be a part of his second coming. It is my prayer that we each are ready for his second coming. That we have 
taken the babe in a manger and made him the king of our lives. I pray this in his powerful name.